Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. Today we're going to be talking about degrees of freedom, both in a broad conceptual sense and then also in a specific sense where we're talking about calculating the standard deviation in a sample and why we divide by the number of observations minus one rather than just dividing by the number of observations. So when we're talking about our different calculations, right, we've, we've broken things down in previous videos into the parameters and the population that we could hypothetically calculate if all of the values were actually known, and then the statistics that we calculate in individual samples where we try to, you know, get an estimate of what's going on in the population. Now in our previous videos uh, on descriptive statistics and measures of central tendency, we talked about how um, the, the sample mean or X bar is an unbiased estimate of the sample population or mu. So we divide, add up all the scores and we divide by the number of scores that there are. However, when we're talking about calculating the variance in a sample, we have to change the formula a little bit and we divide by N minus one because we're adjusting the degrees of freedom in this calculation relative to if all of the scores were hypothetically known, then we could calculate the true population variance by taking the sum of squared errors and just dividing by N. So that's the focus of what we're doing here today. Why is this N minus one and what are degrees of freedom anyway? So degrees of freedom, we can think of as independent bits of information. And as a conceptual example, let's say you hear that some guy named John is a real jerk, right? Are you more inclined to believe that if you hear it from one person or you hear it from 10 people? Well, if you hear it from 10 people, it sounds probably more like John is a jerk, right? Because it's not just one person's opinion. 10 people have independently confirmed that they all think John is a jerk. So that seems like a fairly stable characteristic of who John is. But what if you hear it from 10 people who all met him at one party? Now you don't actually have 10 independent bits of information because all of those people have the same exposure to John. And maybe John was just having a bad day that day. Maybe he's not a jerk. Maybe he was just, you know, in a bad mood, right? So if we have independent bits of information, right, in the first case with 10 people, we're more inclined to believe that John is a jerk. If we have 10 people who are all dependent, right, they all had the same interaction with him, well, that kind of undermines the having 10 pieces of information because they're not actually independent. And we make these kinds of judgments intuitively based on the amount of information that we have all the time. And the more independent information we have, the more certainty we generally have about our subjective impressions. And that's the same in statistics. The only difference is that now we're going to have to make a little bit of a conceptual pivot and really mathematically define what we mean by degrees of freedom and just how certain or uncertain we are uh, based on those degrees of freedom. So in statistics, right, it's, it's crucial to know how many independent bits of information are being used to estimate a parameter. So again, we're taking information from our sample to make estimates about what's going on in the population. So we're going to calculate statistics to estimate parameters. And let's say we want to know the standard deviation in the population. Ideally, right, we could use this formula up here where we say the variance in the population is based on all the scores minus the mean squared divided by n. Um, whereas uh, in the sample, we can only approximate that, right, with the sample uh, variance, where that's the sum of all the scores minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. So why is this n minus 1? Well, the degrees of freedom are based on the number of observations minus the number of estimated parameters. So again, there is some hypothetical true population mean mu, uh, but in each of our samples, we're not going to know mu. We're just going to get x bar, and we're going to have to use it as our unbiased estimate of the population mean. So in each of these samples, if I have three observations, I'm going to get a different x bar in each one, but I ha it's the best estimate I have. So in each of those samples, I have to use x bar rather than using mu in order to make some calculation of the variance or the standard deviation. So depending on how many data points I have then, right, my degrees of freedom are going to change. So here I have three observations. I have to estimate mu using x bar. So I'm going to have uh, three minus one or two degrees of freedom over here. In this example, I have 100 observations, right? I have to estimate mu using x bar, so I'm estimating a single parameter to get my calculation of the standard deviation. So I'll have 100 minus 1 observations for 99 degrees of freedom. So why is it n minus 1, and why does that kind of balancing act work of taking the, the denominator and making it smaller? 
Well, first let's walk through this uh, uh, conceptually in terms of the number of data points that we have and how they work together in the calculation of the standard deviation and the variance. So imagine that I collect two data points. If I tell you the mean and then give you one of the data points, you can easily figure out what the second one would have been. So for instance, if I say the mean is 10 and x1 was 5, you can deduce that x2 must have been 15 in order to produce the mean of 10, because 5 and 15 are the only two numbers that are going to give you that mean of 10. So only one data point there, or if I give you the mean and one data point, the other data point is not free to vary, right? So we've lost a degree of freedom in the calculation of what this mean is. So for deviations away from the mean, we're only going to have n minus 1 degrees of freedom because we have, out of the total data points, once we have the mean, we lose a degree of freedom. Uh, and, and, and we can see that very clearly in this example where we have two data points because there's only one left over and it's fixed. But the same logic would apply if I had three data points and then I gave you the mean and two of them, right? Or four data points and then I gave you the mean and three of them, right? There are, there are only n minus one independent observations in all of those situations. And we can see that a little more easily visually, right? If we think about calculating uh, our estimate of the variance with, let, let's say we, we know what mu is to start with. So if I give you a single point and I give you the population mean, we don't have to make an estimate of mu because we know what mu is, right? So in this case, there's no estimation that's being done. But I only have one data point. So between this observation and mu, I could make some estimate of the variance. It's not a reliable one, right? Because there's only one degree of freedom here. But I could say, oh, okay, well, the standard deviation appears to be about 21, because to the best of my knowledge, people vary around the mean by about 21 points. Now, in contrast, right, let's think about this if we have a single data point and we don't know the population mean, in which case we can't get an estimate of the variance. Because if your sample, right, consists of one person and you have a mean of 94 because your one person had a score of 94, I can get an estimate of the population mean, right? So it might not be a good estimate because, again, it's only based on one person, but I can at least say, okay, the mean of my sample is 94. Therefore, my best estimate of the population mean is also 94, but there's no way I can get an estimate of the variance in this situation because we had to use our sample to estimate the mean. We now have no information about the variance, right? We can't deviate away from the mean when n is equal to 1, so we have zero degrees of freedom for making an estimate about the variance in this situation. Now, if I go to two data points, right, and again, I don't actually know what mu is, I can calculate x bar, right, the sample mean, to get an estimate of mu. And in this case, it's 101, right? So I've got my estimate of the true population mean. I can say how much each of these scores deviate away from that mean. Uh, and now I have some information left over to actually make an estimate about the variance, right? So I can say, oh, well, the standard deviation in this case appears to be 7, um, you know, because in, in terms of the variability away from the mean, both of these scores are a 7. So the typical deviation would be a 7. But now, did the amount of information I had for making that estimate of the standard deviation magically jump from 0 to 2 by adding a single data point? And the answer is, of course it didn't. We only really added one bit of information in this scenario by having that second data point. We've gone from 0 degrees of freedom to 1 degree of freedom, right? We have two data points, but in order to get a, a, a measurement of the variance, we have to estimate the mean. And so when it comes to the calculation of the variance, only one of these scores is free to vary because we've estimated the, the population mean using x bar. So the degrees of freedom for our calculation of the variance should be n minus 1, which in this case is 1. Now, the next thing we want to think about in terms of, okay, well, why is it n minus 1? I mean, we get that it's I'm estimating one parameter, so I'm going to do n minus the number of parameters. But why is it one that actually works? Um, and I, they'll have another video where I go through a more detailed mathematical proof about this. But conceptually, the reason why n minus 1 works is because the sample mean is always going to produce the smallest sum of squared errors. So in my sample, my two data points are almost always going to be closer to the sample mean than they are to the population mean. And that means that my sum of squared errors is going to be smaller uh, around my sample mean than if I had known what the true population mean was. 
and that means the numerator of my fraction is going to get smaller. I'm going to have a smaller sum of squared errors right, in the numerator of my calculation, and therefore I'm going to get a biased estimate of the true variance in the population. Because if x bar is always going to produce a small sum of squared errors than mu, I'm going to be biased to underestimate what the true variance is. Now, we can see this in a little more detail, right? If we think about each of these uh, data points now in a larger sample of six, I can calculate my sample mean as an estimate of the population mean, right? And then I can get the deviance, uh, de deviation for each one. Uh, and then I could sum all of those squared deviations together. Uh, and if I divide by n minus one, I'm gonna get an unbiased estimate, right, in, in s squared. If I just divide by n, I'm going to have a biased estimate here. Because again, if I, if I am using x bar, right, the sample mean to represent mu, then the numerator of this fraction is going to be smaller than if I had used mu. So because the numerator is shrinking, I have to proportionally shrink the denominator in order to make s squared unbiased. So to understand that biased estimator, let's approach the calculation the other way around. So again, our population variance, right, sigma squared, is equal to the sum of every individual in the population minus the mean of the population squared, and then we divide by n. So this is going to give us then, uh, if we actually know what mu is, x minus mu squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared, and therefore we can just divide by n, because all we're really getting then is, okay, what's the mean squared deviation? So here is a hypothetical distribution where we know what mu is. If I have a single observation, right, I can take the difference between that score and the true, true uh, mean in the population squared. Then if I have many observations, right, I could apply the same procedure, and I could get the sum of squared errors of, for each of these scores in terms of their difference from mu. The problem is we don't actually know what mu is most of the time. We have to estimate mu based on our sample, which means we're going to use our sample mean, and in this case I'm using m, right, to contrast it with mu rather than x bar, but this is still the sample mean. So I'm using the sample mean as an estimate of mu. And now I have to calculate the difference between all of my scores and m squared, and then I would be dividing by n. But like we said, the problem is, is that the sample mean is always shifted toward the sample. In the best case scenario, m and mu will be exactly the same value, in which case the sum of squared deviations will be equal in this numerator. But most of the time, m is going to produce a smaller sum of squared errors than mu because the sample mean is always shifted toward the sample. So what that means is, if I use the sample mean in my calculation and I divide by n, I am going to have a smaller, or at best equal, uh, variance to if I had used the true population mean mu. So I've got a biased estimator here, where if I use the sample mean and then divide by n, I'm going to be biased to underestimate the true standard deviation or the true variance in the population. So how can we accommodate this, right? Obviously, we don't want a biased estimate of the variance because that's not going to be a good definition of the sample variance. So the solution, right, is that again, because we're going to be underestimating this population variance, we have to shrink our denominator. Using uh, the sample mean up here gives us a smaller sum of squared errors. So if we can proportionally shrink our denominator, then this will be unbiased and equal to sigma squared. So our goal is to define the sample variance to be an unbiased estimator of the population variance, right? So that the expected variance in the sample is equal to the population variance. Now, from sample to sample, it will vary, but it's going to underestimate as often as it will overestimate. So if we divide by n, we know that we underestimate, and that's bad because we don't want this bias. And so we, we can't really change the fact that m is always going to be closer to, uh, the, or that I should say the sample mean is always going to be closer to the variable than, than mu is, right? Because that's just how we have to do it. We don't know what mu is. We have to use the sample mean in our calculation. So to accommodate this, right, we can adjust the degrees of freedom and shrink the denominator in the calculation. So now because our numerator is proportionally is smaller, we can shrink the denominator proportionally by dividing by the appropriate degrees of freedom, which in this case are n minus 1, because we're using a single parameter in order to, you were using the sample mean in place of the population mean here. And this will give us an unbiased estimate of the population variance if we use the appropriate denominator.
And of course, then this translates into a, sam a sample standard deviation, right, which is just the, the square root of that. But again, we're using n minus 1, uh, and we're just taking our, our variance, which is s squared, and then we take the square root of it to get s, which is the sample st standard deviation, which is then an unbiased estimate of the population standard deviation. So again, in a subsequent video, I can walk through the, uh, the mathematical proof for why it actually happens to be 1 that shrinks this uh, denominator proportionally. Um, but from a conceptual perspective, the most important thing to understand is that our degrees of freedom are based on the number of observations that we have adjusted by the number of parameters that we're going to have to estimate. And that's going to be true for a lot of different things that we calculate in statistics. So that is why we have a different formula for the uh, population variance than we do for the sample variance. And obviously that then carries down into when we're calculating the standard deviation in our sample versus our population. And if we're calculating these things in a sample, we need to divide by the appropriate degrees of freedom, which take into account the fact that we're estimating a single parameter and they will proportionally shrink the denominator so that we have unbiased estimators of s and s squared.